Hey everybody, this is Ben Atkinson and this is our interview series, um, Inspiring Leadership. This week is entitled Keep On Pushing, Hot Lessons from Cool Runnings. Um, Jonathan, could you introduce our guest? Thanks, Ben, and um, welcome to my favourite time of the week. And this is particularly special uh, to me, Devon Harris, three times Olympian, international keynote speaker, and um, also featured was the founding member of the Jamaican bobsleigh team, which featured in that film I love so much, Cool Runnings. Uh, Devon was also, uh, like myself and our, my best mate, uh, Errol Stewart, who he also knows, small world. Uh, he was a, a graduate of the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, and a fine officer in the Jamaican army. But Devon, great to have you on board, welcome. Hey, Jonathan, it's great to be on. Thanks for having me, Ben. Great to meet you. And it's always great to hang out with a fellow Sandhurst grad. <laughs> true. Well, hey, Devin, I mean, I'm going to ask in a minute for you to tell us a bit about your current role, but, you know, international keynote speaker, leadership development, teamwork, diversity. Um, you've done a whole load of social media, you've got your own podcasts, um, and really, uh, people, uh, you're in great demand. So we, we're very grateful that you've made time to be with us today. Let's begin with um, currently what you're doing, um, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, and tell us about your career journey into leadership, including, we've got to hear about these days, about the uh, the bobsleigh team and all the rest. So so uh, off you go. We'd love to hear yeah, about it. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, you know, my vocation, I describe it as, uh, as a motivational keynote speaker. I get uh, the good, I have the good fortune of traveling around the world and, uh, you know, uh, gracing the stages and sharing my experiences, my story, my wisdom uh, with, with audiences globally. Um, I'm also an author. I've written a couple of books. And uh, my, my give back, though, uh, which is equally important, is uh, the Keep On Pushing Foundation. I, I started that a number of years ago, and the goal is to provide practical solutions to some of the issues that are preventing kids in disadvantaged communities from getting properly educated. And so we've started a breakfast program and a school supplies program at my old elementary school uh, in Kingston and, uh, you know, looking to do some other things there. Uh, but, you know, all of this, uh, Jonathan and Ben, uh, I think is informed by uh, what I'm going to describe as my early life experiences. You know, I, I grew up uh, in Olympic Gardens, Kingston. And if you've seen those um, ads on TV about come to Jamaica and feel all right, no, they weren't speaking about my neighborhood at all. <laughs> you don't feel all right in a neighborhood like that. It is one of the toughest getters in the world. Uh, but I was able to uh, kind of make my way from that to Sandhurst. And actually, when I went to Sandhurst, uh, it was my first time out of Jamaica. And you can imagine it was this massive transition, right? This ghetto kid now at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. Uh, um, amazing experience at Sandhurst, and we can spend more time speaking about that. But that's kind of where my, I want to say my leadership journey, certainly the training, as you know, I think we're all leaders in our own right. But at Sandhurst, uh, yeah, they convinced me that I could, that I'm, that I'm actually a leader and I could grow into becoming a better leader. And so that has informed uh, my views on leadership and, and the things that I do uh, to include my role on the Jamaica Bobset team. Yes, I'm one of the original members of that very first team. We competed in Calgary in 1988, not knowing much about bobsledding. You know, we got in the sport mere months before the Olympics. It's kind of crazy, but that's <laughs> what army guys do. And then, uh, you know, I've had a good fortune of competing in two other Olympics. I'm, um, uh, as I mentioned, a three-time Olympian. It's just awesome. And uh, I think those, those kind of experience, we'll talk a bit about the bobsleigh later on, uh, mm -hmm. one of the questions that we talk about inspiring leadership. But really, uh, Ben, over to you. Next mm -hmm. question. With, with, with that sort of journey, is there anything that you would like to, to have known, a piece of advice um, when you're first ch starting out? Um, yeah, yeah, and it, it would be to stop trying so damn hard to be perfect. I, I think that <laughs> was kind of like the bane of my existence, uh, you know, in my early years. I just wanted to be perfect, to be not just the best, but just to be absolutely perfect. And it's a, 
was a cause of uh, much frustration for me because mm -hmm. the fact is that you know there, none of us are per by as human beings we are by nature imperfect beings. Uh, and what I've learned over the years is that it's so much better and so much easier and so much more achievable to be excellent, to simply give off your absolute best every moment, as opposed to, I think you can be perfect in a moment, mm. but you can't, you know, the goal of perfection shouldn't be one that we strive for, but rather to just be the best we can be. How do you, how do you stop yourself doing that? Because like, it's such a, it's such an easy thing to to do when you're like thinking, right? This has got to be perfect. I've got to keep 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 pushing. <laughs> when yeah. do you know? When do you know when to stop? That's well, you know, I, I've had a, a few painful experiences, uh, and so what I've learned is that because if you, what I've found in my own life is that those moments when I, for a minute, thought I wasn't going to hit perfection, then you stop because what's the point? Mm. You're not going to be perfect. And, and then you realize, as, as I've looked back, how much I've missed out and, and how many other awesome accomplishments I could have um, racked up, so to speak, had I just hung in there, even if it wasn't going to be perfect, I would have been awesome, I would have been excellent. And yeah. so, you know, after you've been burned a few times, you realize that it's not working, this perfection. Mm. Yeah. And that goes sort of, I've sort of experienced that a lot. And and I pro we probably wouldn't be be speaking right now if I hadn't sort of got over that because like putting things like this out like the interview series, um, writing um, pieces and, and posting them. Um, if you if you keep on doing that and sort of waiting till it's perfect, you never ever show them to anybody else. You never ever ship them. Um, so you, so nobody ever sees actually how 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 good you are at stuff. Exactly, I it's, think it's exactly. a great piece of advice. Forgive me, I, I live in America here where we, we speak over all the people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you're right, though. Uh, you know, and if you just if you take a look across uh, the, the, the landscape of uh, industry, you'll mm. find products all the time that huge multinational, multi billion dollar companies put out that weren't perfect, right? Mm. Whether it's a, a piece of software that they send out a patch uh, for later on or a car or a vehicle that they had to recall. It wasn't mm. perfect, but they didn't um, prevent that from, from you know, allowing them to move forward. And so we yeah. can learn from that. Yeah, yeah. good advice. And I'm really, uh, I'm excited to see some of the guys who I know are, are listening in. We've got about 140 people who are listening in to you, Devin. You've got a great pulling power. Um, I've seen Sean Taylor, Sean was in the army. Um, I, I seem to remember Sean was Royal Military Police, very fine officer. Uh, he's got his own post now. He's a he's a, a great wizard in the financial markets. Got great. Watch his blog; it's very good. Chris Klaus, good to see him uh, on the series. Keep on pushing. Good headline. And Kevin Rustling, uh, who's a, another international leader who I know. Um, it's great to have them on. So, just saying, if people have got questions or points they want to make, and make sure if you have a good question. Uh, for Devon, uh, keep them short and punchy. Otherwise, so much of a question when it gets posted on there that Devon and, and Ben and I are just looking over the top of the top for so long. So <laughs> short, punchy, question, keep them coming. Uh, my question for you, Devon, would be: um, you know, you've had all these highs and lows in your life, some good times. You've you've driven yourself really, really hard. I mean, to become an Olympian is just awesome. And and I know other Olympians, and and you have to give your all, your everything. So what about proudest moment and some of the darkest moments because uh, i don't know about you but i've had loads of dark moments in my life i probably learned more from the dark moments than the proudest but yeah. what would you say you've are those moments and what do they teach you yeah um so, you know hope so but perhaps my proudest moments are you know when my kids were born and i have five so those are five really proud moments but outside of that Oh, um, I, yeah, I, I probably have to go with the Olympics. Yeah, I, I got five. It's been busy, man. They say, make hay while the sun shines. It's been sunny. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what was happening when five kids and Devon arrived. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, perhaps it's, it was that moment, uh, Ben, when I marched in the opening ceremonies in Calgary in 1988. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so most of us grew up watching the Olympic Games, watching the opening ceremonies and seeing those men and women marching and, and you're just filled with admiration, right? And you're mm -hmm. thinking, oh, those are some of the best athletes in the world. And then one day you are the guy 
and you step foot in the stadium with 50,000 people screaming, and I promise you more cameras than you can count. And you know in that moment, you are on TV around the world. Your image be, is being flashed around the world. And there's probably some little kid looking at you thinking, wow, he must be one of the best athletes in the world. And you're kind of hoping that you can live up to that expectation. But yeah, it's it's one of those moments, man, that like they're right in Hollywood, right? Really, really proud moment. Um, darkest moment. Huh, I, I don't know how you define dark, so I'm going to, uh, you know, define it as the most challenging moment. And yeah, there are a number of them, but perhaps the, for me, it was my early army career, you know, being this ghetto kid, uh, trying to fit into the middle class of the officer corps, right? I kind of went from ghetto to army officer, uh, like from zero to 60 in three seconds. And just trying to feel like I belong, um, trying to feel accepted, trying to be accepted by some people, trying to deal with, you know, quite frankly, what I what I considered abuse of power by one or two people, because they, you know how it is, they were senior to me. And yeah, that was, wow, that was a really, rough patch in my life. It was a lonely journey. Um, it's, you know, you when you're in the military, as you know, Jonathan, and you're posted, you're, you, you, you know, you're not in touch with your civilian friends, really. You know, I'm not, I, I'm the oldest kid. It's not like I had a sibling I could go, you know, chew the bone with and, you know, talk about my problems. I had to deal with it all by myself. So, yeah, it was a challenging and a lonely time, but I got through it. Yeah, uh, right, and, and so so resonates uh, with so many people. And we've got Sean and, and Chris have both got questions. Let's put Sean's on, if you would, please, mm. Ben. Yeah, Jeff, sure. Uh, amazing to have you on. What key skill would you say has helped you the most on your journey? Um, determination, persistence, pers perseverance. Choose a, choose a word that that that, that you will. I I just I just you know uh, detailed like my early days in the army and you know there are just moments when you're frustrated and um, yeah you just have to learn to hang in there man you have to learn to just um, you know when I was younger and more sprightly and I would go for these really long runs and I would be exhausted I would put my mantra was you know put one foot in front of the other and it's a painful tedious yeah frustrating journey. But if you find a way to put one foot in front of the other, you eventually get to where you're going. And I find that to be true in life. That's been my experience. Just, yeah, putting one foot in front of the other. Great advice. And let's put Chris. Chris is, I'm sure, Chris, I know. I'm sure he's serving the army as well. QDRM. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you serve uh, how do I rebuild from disappointment? Uh, <laughs> after I'm done cursing. Um, <laughs> You, well, it depends on the, the situation, right? So if it's a, a goal that you still have an opportunity to, to hit, you go, well, you know, what did I do wrong? What can I learn from this experience? And, and, and you kind of regroup and start building again towards that goal. And if it's something that the, the train has left the station, you know, yeah, you, you know, you take a, you, it's, it's like you take a punch, a punch to the emotional solar plexus, man, but, you know, life goes on. And so you, um, you, you kind of, I tend to refocus on that longer term vision, that longer term goal that I had. And like, this didn't quite work out. Um, uh, but you know what, I still live to fight another day. And you, you just, we have to learn, um, guys, not to beat ourselves up. We're so good at beating ourselves up, you know, because we failed and uh, we just we pr pr produced disappointing results. Mm -hmm. I get it because you've invested a lot of energy into, uh, you know, creating those results. But it's not the end of the world. You get to live to fight another day. So you have to learn eventually to shrug it off and move on. Yeah, well, Chris is, um, I see he was extra all signals like myself and uh, serving in the Ministry of Defence. Um, he also has worked with BAE Systems, so he's got a lot of experience there. But it, it is interesting you talked about visioning, and I'm really interested. A lot of people uh, wonder how to create a vision for their team, 
uh, or the organization they're in charge of. Do you have a sort of simple way of creating a vision, just crafting a vision so people will follow a leader and his team? I, I think you, well, first of all, it has to be something that is challenging, right? You have to be thinking about what would be your the ideal situation if you, in your own personal life or for your team, if you woke up tomorrow and you were, your life was just the best, just, you couldn't ask for more, you're happier. Kind of like when I got to Sandhurst, I was happier than a pig in slop, right? Like, <laughs> Like, what more could I want? Man, I'm at Sandhurst, right? Um, I, I, and so if I look at that experience as a kid from the hood, dreaming about going to Sandhurst, like it's just impossible, it's all the way out there. And that's how, like when I ran the Jamaica bobsled uh, team, that was um, my approach. Uh, and yeah, these young kids who were coming up, they knew about cool runnings, they had never seen a bobsled, but that was hey these are the goals that we're going going after i think when you believe it when you can embrace that within your own psyche you are able to um communicate that with 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 passion and a, and a certain amount of believability and if you get the people behind it then yeah great things are going to happen so how, how did you actually end up on the bobsleigh team what was what was the story there? What because that making that decision must have been like quite a big big deal. How did how did it get get yeah. involved? So I, let me try and give it a shorter version of the story. So you know, of course, grew up in Jamaica where everybody is a sprinter except me. I'm mm. a I'm a, a, a rather fast sprinter anyway. I'm a middle distance runner, uh, and my idol at the time was Lord Sebastian Co. 800, 1500 meter guy. So I come back from Sandhurst, I'm 21 years old, and I remember I'm, I'm walking down to the officer's mess and I'm having this really intense conversation with myself. I'm like, so you have achieved your big dream, you're an, you're an army officer. Is this it? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Come on, man. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, the Olympics. So it's 1987 and the Olympics are coming up the following year in Seoul, Korea. So I start... Uh, training. I started getting up in the mornings to go around five miles before I have to report for duty. You know, some mornings I would deliberately leave for my run late, which meant that I had to run harder because I got to report for duty late, right? As, uh, the adjutant was very, the, all young officers will know, the adjutant was very liberal with them extra duties. <laughs> <laughs> so um, two Americans run about that same time. They lived in Jamaica, had business and family connections here. They came up with the idea to start a bobsled team because they'd seen uh, the pushcart derby and they realized that a big part of the race is a start. Jamaica had lots of sprinters. The summer guys didn't want to do it, so they came to the army looking for athletes. And um, interestingly enough, um, uh, Ben, they, the guy who ran I was in charge of sports uh, at the time, was the first uh, person from the JDF to ever attend Sandhurst, Colonel Ken Barnes, who was the father of John Barnes, English international. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, this is a wonderful idea. So my colonel uh, saw me run across country and go, oh, he's fit. Um, <laughs> when, I came, when I got back from Jamaica, initially I was limping. I, I jumped from a, a plane in Netherhaven and brought my ankle. Oh, was right. that smart? Um, we, did, we did in the parachute course. Yes, 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 yes. For adventure training. Didn't have to do it, but begged and begged and begged, and they relented, and that's what happened. Um, so I learned my lesson. Two jumps. Never did this again. But uh, <laughs> so the colonel sent me to the team trials, not expecting me to make the team. He just wanted to fill bodies because of a philosophy in the, uh, in the army. That says officers must always participate, and he had a bunch of enlisted men going to the team drills. But I, I just knew I didn't know how I was going to make the team. I just knew I had to make the team, and so I just, you know, I was what at the time what I would call armor fit. You know, mm. like hundred miles of fifty pounds on your back, a rifle in your hands. I didn't think I was sports fit, but I went and I just tried my darnest, and here we are. <laughs> Amazing. Well, you're not a little bit, um, a little bit sort of scared of the prospect of shooting down that hill in a in a little <laughs> on a tea tray. 
Yes. Um, I, I, so I tell people all the time that I'm scared of speed and height, but, but and because I joke around so much, I think I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. I'm like, <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I remember well, uh, my first run, which is from the half mile, when you just start out in the sport, you don't go all the way to the top. Yeah. And I was a brake man. And I was crawling in a sled behind a guy who had never driven a sled before. <laughs> uh, and I just remember thinking to myself, you know, if I die, I die. <laughs> but, but I'm going. There was just no way I was not going to go. And, and we had three runs that, that first night. And by the third run, I was hooked. I was still scared to death, yeah. man. But I was hooked. Wow. So, that's good, yeah. That's it. I love that one. Let's see. Kevin wants to build on one of the things you said, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, let's put Kevin's up there. I like one front in front of the other, but how after your team's been battered and bruised, can you help them rebuild? And Kevin's uh, picked himself up many times with getting a big bruising, and I'm sure you have, and I have, and Ben has. So yeah, advice. So yeah, so after the team, um, you know, if the dream, if the dream, if the vision hasn't changed, then there's just work uh, left to be done. And the thing about uh, a compelling vision is that. It has its own energy, its own power to pull you. And if you can still believe in the possibility of that dream, you know, I think, I think, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna take a licking, man. You're gonna take a whipping, and um, you know, sometimes you're badly bruised, and and you just have to, you know, soldier on, as we say. And there are other times I like, you know, I can think of times you know, doing other things where. Yeah, yeah, we got a good whipping, and we just laughed about it. Well, that was a the Jamaican word is boss ass. You yeah, you can see of my best man Errol, uh, who would say when we were doing the running at Sanders, he says, "Man, I'm going to give you a big licking because you're yeah, a yeah, yeah. <laughs> right." You know, and you just like you know what you you, you take it. Um, uh, yeah, like I said earlier, yeah, you really have to learn. Uh, not to beat yourself up too much. It's just like, uh, I almost swore, but you know, after you have done with the swearing, you just have like, all right, um, what next? How can we get this? How can we get this? I, I think if you really believe in the vision, you 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 just find a way to, yeah. to keep going, to keep on pushing. Wow. So one of the things we always sort of ask us people who come on here um, is about the habits that have made them successful. And and you've been sort of successful in a number of parts of your life, which I'm sure have taken like a lot of dedication and, and real sort of habits to, to, to get there. Um, and, and we also sort of break it up into healthy, wealthy and wise. So what are the habits that have made you successful around, around being healthy, both sort of mentally and physically? Um, well, one, I love, I, I love working out. So let's talk about physical, being physically healthy. You know, it's, I, and, and, you know, if you're in an army or if you've, uh, you know, uh, done sports at a high level, you know, you have a screw missing because you love pain, you love running and feel like you're going to die. And then you, you don't die and go, oh, that was fun. <laughs> 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 I'm still trying to understand that, but, um. So, um, so, uh, I, so that's the thing that, that kind of keeps me healthy, I want to say, physically. Mentally, I, I, I think it's just exposure. I, um, well, first of all, I, I hate the idea. I feel so powerless um, operating when I'm, when I'm worried. So I try not to, I, I really don't worry. Um, and and part of my training at Sandhurst, I think, really informed that because remember when you have those command appointments and things are going crazy, like you had to learn to be calm, right? You don't didn't want to see like a flapper, um, and so you learn. Okay, it's it's not going well, but be calm, be calm, and and so I've just learned to apply that uh, to my life outside of the army, so to speak. And so that that's how I keep physically healthy, I guess, and, and um, um, wealthy, it's, it, I'm a dreamer. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, which character you know, most closely resemble you. In Cool Runnings, and I choose Jules Brenner, the bald-headed guy, not because he was a mean uh, guy, he had a mean streak, but because he was a dreamer. He's a guy 
that wanted to go to Buckingham Palace to live. Now, you see how impossible that is? But that's how dreams are. They start out just being ridiculous, like, you know, just impossible. Uh, but you have to dream them because sometimes, and I talk about, you know, going to the Olympics, you have these dreams. And if you really commit and really believe in it, sometimes that just creates this amazing, wonderful detours that's even better than the original dream. Um, but but that requires a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline, and and the determination, as I was speaking about. Mm. And is there a piece of wisdom that you like to strive to live your life by? Um, well, you know, without being sounding too cliche, it's actually you know what you see on my shirt. Man, keep on pushing. I just I've been. <laughs> Well, well, let me explain it as well, because, you, you know, it's not just about fighting to overcome uh, difficulties and obstacles. You know, that's part and parcel of it, I think. But it's it's we have to recognize that success is a journey. It's not a destination. It's not a, and it's never a one and done. Um, so it's about growth. It's, so it's, it's about learning new things, learning new ideas. It's about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone so you can have new experiences and then figuring a way to use your existing skill set and your experience and knowledge in a new uh, environment because we live in a very dynamic world. And so how are you going to use your existing skill set and knowledge and experience in this new environment to create new opportunities or take advantage of the, the opportunities? So, you know, I with a keep on pushing mindset, you, you, you leave yourself open to be... Um, uh, to take advantage of the opportunities while pushing yourself past the difficulties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, fantastic. And before I ask the next question, we've got Venkat, who's uh, been on our series before, and he said, Hi, Devon. They say risk-taking leads to success, but how does one stand strong, strong through the tough roads even when things start looking bad? <sighs> <laughs> so I say it all the time. I don't know how to give up. Um, <laughs> no, no, but here's the thing. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ben, um, here's the thing. Successful people give up all the time. They give up on the strategy. They change the plan. They don't give up on the vision. And... You know, I think of like my third Olympic Games, you know, like you think that going to Calgary the first time was the most difficult. No, going to Nagano in 98 was the most difficult. I did not get sponsorship until January 1998. The Olympics were in February. Um, you know, I'm a Sandhurst grad, two-time Olympian, retired Army uh, captain. I'm in Evanston, Wyoming, training eight hours a day and delivering pizzas at night. <laughs> like, so, because like, because I just don't know how to give up. So even when you're battered and bruised, man, and you sometimes can't see the way forward, you, I, again, I, without being at the risk of stone and cliche, you have to find a way to put mm. one foot in front of the other. Yeah. Very inspiring. Thank you. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about leadership and teams, but I'm going to leave that for now. I'm really interested. Ben, you and I talked about uh, the fact that we've been in this pandemic, we're in it, and it's going to carry on running. But there's been other things that have been going on which are quite well changing. One of my leaders said the three things he's focusing on, digitization of his business, diversity and inclusion, and ESG, environment, social, and governance. But he said that, that the Black Lives Matter issue that's really been brought to front is long overdue and something needs to be done. I'd love to hear your view about the death of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Do you want to just share your views? Yeah, sure. You know, um, so certainly here in America, uh, you know, people, you know, African Americans, you know, I don't describe myself as an African American, I'm Jamaican. I'm a Jamaican, I'm a Jamaican American. Um, you know, but, but black people will talk all the time about the experiences that they have with the cops. And, I, and honestly, I, I'm, I've had a few run-ins with nothing to, write home about, you know, just experiences that I thought could have gone differently, but hey, it is what it is. But people have had some really horrific experiences repeatedly. And I think 
And I understand why a white person would have a hard time believing it because it's just not their experience and they live in the same city. Uh, they're not seeing it. One of the, the good things about COVID-19 is a, is a lockdown. And so people weren't busy running to work and running to take the kids to games and other activities. They were forced to be home. And so for any person with a conscience to see uh, this white cop kneeling on a man's knee neck and killing him, it has to be jarring. Uh, and if, that, if there's one good thing that came out of this COVID-19 is the fact that people had a chance to actually digest this horrific act. And, and so, yeah, they start to go, wow, now I see what these black people have been talking about all these years, you know, it's, it's really bad. Um, and, but of course the Black Lives Matter movement has had started before the George Floyd uh, killing. And there are obviously lots of people who supported, lots of white people who supported across the world, not just here in the US, but then there are others who don't, right? And they, they go, all lives matter or blue lives matter. And I think what, what they, they are misunderstanding, I'm gonna say, the intent of Black Lives Matter. They're not, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is not saying Black people's lives matter more than anybody else's. What it's saying is that Black Lives Matter as well, um, because it's not, it's not just in policing, you know, and I can speak, I guess, more intelligently um, about what I've observed in America, right? It's, it's education, it's healthcare, it's fi banking and financing. It's all those areas where black people are at a decided uh, disadvantage for no other reason than the color of their skin. And so, yeah, those are th just attitudes that quite frankly uh, has no place in modern history, modern day uh, society, but we also know it's human nature. I, I will ne probably will never understand because I'm not a social scientist, uh, but there's a, a, a thing about us as human beings that uh, wants to find a way to say, I am better than you. Um, and we're not talking about, as an athlete, I understand that concept, but but that, hey, I'm better than you at this thing in this moment. That's how athletes approach it. But these people are like, I am a better person, more deserving human being than you because of where you're from or your ethnicity or, or whatever, which is you know quite frankly garbage. Mm. What do, you, what do you think can be done? Uh, you know, there's some practical things wherever we are that we can each do differently, or the way we think about things, or the way we treat people. If you were to just give us two or three tips of the things you believe that should be done, that maybe people are doing, but just keep doing, they'll make a big difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged uh, because I think uh, the we have started with, uh, in, in, at some level anyway, with those uncomfortable conversations is I think, you know, white people in a room by themselves will have a very different conversation than when there's a black person around. And I think it's important that they have those conversations with their black friends and ask um, about their experiences because they may very well be very ignorant about what the, ex the real experiences are. And I think, just starting to have those conversations um, is going to inform them and help them to speak to or have those similar similar conversations with those people who may not be on board with the Black Lives Matter movement. This idea of equality, um, mm -hmm. because when it when it when you you know kind of strip it all down, hey, we're all the same, man, and. Um, you know, I tell you an experience I had with, you know, because one of the things I speak about is diversity. My first Olympic Games was significant in many ways, right? Not, uh, of course, it was the first time, but I'm a newly minted officer from Sandhurst. And you know as well as I do, John, um, uh, Jonathan, that um, we were told that everybody behind the Iron Curtain was evil, right? I, I can clearly remember the sign at Sandhurst the only good red is a dead red with a smoking hole in his head, right? Um, so here I am, I'm in the Olympic Village uh, and we're in the game market. So of course I'm dating myself because today we have a cyber shark, as, you know. Um, and I'm there and I'm killing the Pac-Man, right? I'm playing Pac-Man. 
And off to my right is a guy from East Germany. Off to my left is a guy from Poland. They're from behind the Iron Curtain. And it dawned on me that, you know, man, there's, we have so much more in common. They, uh, we, we, we share the same human aspirations. We want to be the best and compete and for our, our respective countries. And we suffer from similar human frailties and phobias. And so the only real difference between us then was ideology. And it was the ideology that we created, was ideology that was put on us by somebody that was fed to us. And, and so, yeah, in that moment, it dawned on me that, you know what, we, we are all so much more alike than what meets the eye. Yeah. I know. Yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's great to hear your, your, um, your thoughts and, um, and you'd be happy to know that it really had a profound effect over here as well. And, and, and as, um, as you said, having those conversations, it's really sort of started lots of really healthy conversations, and and it feels like it's it's a uh, it's a time where real change is actually actually happening, which which is good to see. But um, and one of the things is it's um, ne uh, next month um, in the UK it's um, Black History Month. I know that in the in the US you you, you have, um, celebrate Black Black History Month in in February. Um, is there um, is there any part of black history that you think we should all educate ourselves about that we should all um, all uh, go away and, and, and do some do some good reading or, or uh, a piece of black history you'd, you'd love um, to, to talk about? Apart from the fact that Jamaica went to the Olympics in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, I just think, you know, you know, there's been black contribution across the spectrum of society, industry, and everything. And we all have our different interests. So maybe in your field, in, in the area that you're interested in, maybe you can uh, do some research, um, mm. you know, to see, you know, what were the contributions of black people to this thing that I'm so passionate about. And you might be surprised because... Yeah, practical in every aspect of our of the life that we live today in modern day society, there's been significant contribution by black people across the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got uh, a question from Venkat, which we'll, we'll um, put up. Um, where do you see the movement going, um, given the global scenario where radical right ideology is growing? Um, nobody said it was going to be easy, you know, and, and the fact is that, for want of a better term, the oppressor um, resists ferociously to give up power, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really requires um, not militancy uh, in terms of violence, just steadfastness. It requires people, you know, both black and, you know, white people alike to um, decide that this ends, you know, the, the thing I know, and if you look through history, you'll find this to be true. Um, no group, no one group of people can be oppressed forever. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, like people just like, you know what, I'm done. I'm like, that's, that's kind of how I operate personally. It's just like, I'm done. Um, I'm done with this BS. Uh, let, let's, let's get it on. Um, but so seriously, I don't think that people, uh, you know, well-meaning people, people who really believe in equality have to be steadfast because eventually, I don't know, can't give you a timeline, it, things will change. Yeah, definitely. Well, definitely. Can I pick up a theme really with uh, Ben and I are interested in, in COVID-19? You're there in New York. New York was quite an epicenter of, of COVID-19. Um, and I don't know whether we're looking at something like 200,000 people dying by Christmas in America. It's it's really big. I mean, it's big here as well. And we've got this big upsurge. Uh, our second wave is starting to hit us. Um, what's been the impact for you personally? And 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 how do you think it's um, it's going to affect your country and the way things are done? Yeah. So by the way, there we I think we're over 205,000 deaths now um, here. And where I live in New York, um, the original epicenter, New Rochelle, I live like 25 miles from there. 
Um, so, you, you know, my response has always been to, you know, just kind of breathe into the moment. This is what it is right now. You know, uh, as, as I said, you, you can, I kind of go back to my Sanders days. Things are crazy. It's gone to the dogs. Okay. The milk has been spilled. How do you fix it? And um, and so I, I, I was always one who was happy to uh, physically distance, wash my hand, and I try not to touch my face, you know, wear a mask, do all the things that, authorities, the authorities suggest that we should do. You know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, you, you know, I, I just, I choose to believe the science. And, and if the science is wrong, uh, at least in the end, I, from the from the point of view that it wasn't as deadly, at least at the end, I'm still safe and people that I love are still safe. Um, and so I think that's part of the challenge with people uh, choosing not to believe the science. and. Uh, quite frankly, are in discipline, and I and I get it. it. Can be really difficult to say you're gonna look, sit, especially if you live in say New York City in an apartment. It's it's mm. challenging to sit in a small apartment a building. Um, you know, I live outside the city. I have a yard. I have a driveway. I can go hang out if I want, right, without uh, and and endangering myself. But that's the nature of, of, of life, you know, uh, you know, existence on this earth. There are just certain things and certain times when we can't have things the way we want it. And I guess the athlete in me and the soldier in me recognizes that there are just times when you, you have to just embrace the suck. Um, and, and so I've had to do that, you know, personally at home and, and professionally as well. I think I was sharing with you that the last time I was physically on that stage was March. Now, mm. if meetings aren't being held, uh, I'm not getting invited to speak. And that's uh, a, a big hit on my income. And, uh, you know, um, and so it doesn't mean that I don't feel stress, but again, it's such a disempowering place from which to operate so once you once i feel that i you know take some deep breaths and i just okay so now what's the next move how do i push myself from here and you know it's it's learning new skills it's learning how to uh be better on social media and you know figuring out what digital programs i'm going to create um and you know i, I still haven't sat down to write a book but that's you know, one of the things that I, I, I need to do. So yeah. if, if you, yeah, kind of find a way to redirect your energies into new activities that you think can help you to get through the process, you'll be okay. Do you, do you miss being on stage, Devin? Yeah, absolutely. Is that part, part of the job that you, that you enjoy? Um, you, know, the, you know what I enjoy most about uh, being on stage is getting off stage and having someone say, wow, I needed that. I felt like you were speaking to me. Yeah. That's the best part. So, well, yeah. so we'll... speaking to somebody there, Anthony Cope, do you want to put Anthony's comments up? Yeah, one second. Okay. I've reached that place in my life too, Devon. Enough of the BS. I'm doing something about it too. Facts, truth, and words are my weapons. The force is with us both. I like it. Nice, I nice sentiment. <laughs> Yeah, facts, truth, and words. Yeah, I just, I just, I think that look, as I said earlier, I've had you know a couple of run-ins uh, with the cops. Nothing life-threatening, I would say. Uh, but uh, because I'm okay, so to speak, it doesn't mean that I should not be passionate about what's going on, right? I think all of us have a responsibility to share our voice and to do what we can. Um, to make things better. Uh, there's no, there's nothing I hate more than injustice in any form or any shape to anyone, right? It, it really irks me. And mm. yeah, um, you know, I, I'm a three-time Olympian, blah, blah, blah. But you know what they see first? A black man. And, I'm, yeah. and I recognize that. So um, on, on the um, subject of leadership, so so what, because um, I think that's really important now and, and it's something that you, you've you obviously led um, in lots of situations. So so what makes a good good leader, um, in, in your opinion? Um, I, so one of, my, one of my big 
words is with almost everything is authenticity. I think you need to be authentic. We think about the number of times you have met someone, whether they're in a leadership role or not. And you go, I don't know, I can't put my finger on it, but there's a something off with that person, that guy, that girl, right? So I think it's really, really important if you're going to uh, be able to earn the trust and respect and have the have credibility with the people who are under your charge, that you show up authentic, that you show up just being yourself. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the things I, uh, for me personally, is not necessarily something that I don't think they taught me that at Sandhurst. Um, it's to is to treat people. It's a golden rule, man. Treat people the way you want to be treated. I, I think it's really important because some of us get so caught up in the title, mm. get so caught up in the position. I'm up here, man, and you better know your place. And and so if the rules were switched, if you were down here and somebody else was up, up here, would you want them to treat you like crap? And if the answer is no, then don't treat other people like that. Because here's the thing, when you treat people well, you endear them to you. How do you achieve success as a leader. Mm -hmm. It's not through your efforts, it's through the efforts of other people, the people who you're leading. And so mm -hmm. when you're able to get them to buy into you as a person, like so I go back to the authenticity, when you get them to buy into to you because you're treating them as a whole person, not just as an instrument of production, they will go to the moon and back. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. And I, I think it's also important to be um, vulnerable, to show vulnerability as a leader. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you, you don't have to have all the answers, man. And in fact, in today's world, uh, it's, it's virtually impossible for you to have all the right answers. Uh, we live in such a complex world. You know, your job as a leader is to bring all the, the stakeholders, all the players in the room and go, okay, so this is the situation, and um, this is what I'm thinking, but let me hear what you're thinking. And, you know, you know, get buy-in. Uh, people will do a whole lot more, even if you're not taking their ideas because they think that you're listening to their ideas and you can make a strong enough point as to why you're not using their idea or you're using a version of their idea. You'll get, get buy-in and everybody succeeds. Yeah, and get more energy from them as well. Someone yeah, so wants to work hard for you. It's much uh, much easier than making them work hard for you, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree. You know, it's, some of us, um, because we have the title and we want the praise, we want to go, oh, I did it. You know, I did it. Um, as opposed to, hey, we did it. Because when you're pointing at them, they're pointing back at you. And they yeah. just, you just keep getting more, man. It's like, the well that never ends. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's one question here from David English. Um, how do you manage that balance between a leader and a friend? A good one from David. I have looked at David. He's a friend. That's, of a, that's a really good one. I, I'm a, and I'm kind of thinking back. I had an experience in uh, 1992 with my brake man. Um, I did, didn't feel like he was putting enough effort and, into preparing the sled. And... Uh, I guess I'm like, how can you be on the sled and you're not putting in the effort? Right? So I just think friends sometimes have to tell friends the things they don't want to hear. Mm. And I think that's the kind of one of the definition of a true friend, right? Um, as, a, as a follower, you, you know, and a, and a friend of the leader, I am supportive. I make sure that I do everything um, to support that that person and, and not to make the role any more difficult. And, and so there's a part of me that kind of expects that from friends that I lead. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you do have to have those difficult um, conversations. You have to recognize and and be confident in your own abilities to lead and then just i think if you're doing you know what i'm going to call all the right things you're being authentic and you're engaging and giving people an opportunity for the most part they're going to um follow your lead and 
and give you their opinions as well. And you have to be willing to accept or listen, I should say. Yeah. I always say, you know, you, you should listen, but you reserve the right to accept or decline the ideas. Yeah. Right? Well, I suppose if, if you've got that relationship of, of a friend and a leader, then it's, it's, it's again, really important about that honesty piece, isn't it? It's, it's like Absolutely. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're a friend, you call out your, the, your friend who's a leader for, for any of their BS and, and vice versa, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what makes those relationships work and thrive uh, so well because of that honesty. Mm. And that fine balance between respect, seeking respect rather than seeking popularity. And I know both as an officer and as a leader, I got it wrong when I was trying to be popular rather than actually doing the right thing. Mm. People who respected maybe they wouldn't like me, but they'd know it to be the right thing. Uh, thanks to that. Um, and also Anthony, uh, Anthony Cope makes a, a, a long point here, but uh, Anthony, uh, absolutely spot on, Devon. I've been on the receiving end of some terrible bosses uh, who are facilitated by poor management. My learning has been uh, to not sink to their level. This is, I presume Obama is right. Mm -hmm. Then they go, they go high. Michelle is just a beautiful icon of mine. I agree. Uh, both he and her husband. Um, what thoughts come up from that? I, um, I totally agree. It's one of those areas that I quite frankly um, have a lot of work, a lot of work to do on because my personality is of such that if you push me, I'm pushing back. I'm mm -hmm. perhaps going to push back. I'm, I'm inclined to push back and push back even harder. Um, but I also recognize as I'm older and hopefully, you know, a little bit wiser, um, that that's not always the, the best approach. Uh, you know, I, I do not suffer fools gladly. Um, uh, but yeah, you, you kind of have to learn, um, uh, you know, to kind of temper it down as, and as she said, you know, when they go low, you go high. That's actually the, the, the right advice. Yeah. Quick comment from the chat. Um, former Indian president and definitely a great person, APJ Abdul Kalam, always said a leader is one who shares the success with the team and takes blame to himself, pushing the team towards collective goal. Lovely comment. Thank you, Venkat. Um, another question for you, um, Devon. So, on the on the subject of lead, leaders, who's a leader that's inspired you? Um, so, you know, when I was at Sandhurst, remember we, we had to study a leader and make a presentation, Ben. So, uh, I mean, sorry, Jonathan. So, um, the guy that I chose back then was, uh, JFK. And, um, the thing I, I was in, uh, found inspiring about him was that he was a great visionary and a very aspirational leader. And I love that. Absolutely love mm -hmm. that. But. Uh, to kind of go back to the last discussion we had, you know, I'm, I, I'm so inspired by Nelson Mandela as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, he is the epitome of humility uh, and forgiveness, uh, which, mm -hmm. I, again, is one of those areas that, that I absolutely uh, need to work on, right? I look at how, you know, he came out of prison after 28 years with, with such humility, but more importantly, such forgiveness and i'm like wow he is a hundred times a better man than i am and uh, and again recognize how powerful you know what he did uh was and continue to be and that's something that i strive to that's a way i strive to become yeah now we, we could talk for another three or four hours with <laughs> any guy and i can see you've got uh keep on uh, keep on pushing 88 um People can find you on LinkedIn. If people want to get you to be a speaker, um, reach out to LinkedIn and places like that. So really, I can see why you are so popular as a speaker. So let people around the world reach out to you. Our final two questions, Ben and I were going to ask you. Um, mine, I'll go first and let Ben have the last one. What would you like your legacy to be, um, Devin? What would you like your legacy to be? Hmm. Uh, it's simple, man. Just uh, a guy who helped others, who willingly helped others. You know, so if at my funeral there were just, you know, rows and rows of people talking about, 
you know, how I help them directly or indirectly, then my living would not have been in vain. Lovely. Yeah. And, um, just final question. Um, what would uh, be a good book recommendation from you, Devon? Either something you've picked up in lockdown or something that's been important to you um, in, in your life. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sad to say I'm not reading any new books now. I'm rereading um, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and um, Wayne Dyer, um, Wishes Fulfilled. So I'd, yeah, I'd recommend those. Lovely. Devon, it's been an absolute pleasure. So, so good to have you um, on the show. And, um, and thanks to everyone who's been, who's been asking uh, all the questions and, and listening in. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. And yeah, I appreciate all the, the feedback and the questions from our listeners, viewers as well. Well, it's been, it's been great. From my point, I'm uh, really proud to make the Jamaican connection and with my, my, my good friend and best man, Errol. Um, and, and also nice to see Paul Cooper, who was on it before, saying, thank you. You are definitely a super role model to us all. Paul, what a wealth of experience in business. And Anthony uh, Cope finally saying, yes, Devin, right about JFK. Any Nixon could have gone to China, but any JFK could send us to the moon. Nelson Mandela is uh, Mediva to me. He's the model I strive to emulate. Guys, thank you. You've, you've, um, Devin, you've been an inspiration to us, and I can see why. Uh, keep on pushing is definitely the mantra that I'm going to try and live by, uh, as long as Ben will too. But thanks. Stay on. We'll chat to you after we've gone live. Sure. Thanks, man.